This government meeting is brought to you by Eastworks and our local cable subscribers. All right, so this is the East Hampton Affordable and Fair Housing Partnership. It is Thursday, January 26th, and it is 6 p.m. Now we're here. Hi, great to meet you. Amy Zuckerman, Affordable Housing Advocate. Hi, let me take my thing off. Great, welcome. Thank you. All right, let me sit down. We just, media. yeah, we just started, so have a seat. Oh, I'm good, thank you. Media person here to help. All right, I'll sit down and then I have to get my breath. All right, All right. Um, it is, what time is it? 614 p.m. There's people over here. Excuse me. I'm on Zoom. We're on Zoom. We're recording, too. No, I didn't realize. Okay. So I have to no problem. Um, so I do have an amendment to the agenda um, because, well, I have two amendments to the agenda. One is I don't have the December meeting notes for your review and approval, so we will do that next time. Um, and then the second is about the Tasty Top project because I thought that I edited my last agenda, but they're not here, obviously. So we are not going to have a conversation with them, but we can have a conversation about the project in preparation for um, the public hearing that's coming up. So those are my two amendments to the agenda. So you're not, we're not having discussion on that or you're we are having, we can have a discussion on the Tasty Top, but there, it says discussion with them and they're not. A discussion about. About, yes. Continued discussion of. Um, so I apologize for that. I made an error on my agenda. Um, so we do have a couple guests, which is exciting. Um, so we can introduce ourselves. Um, so my name is Jana Tatro. I'm the chair of the partnership. I'm Jamie Webb. I'm the assistant planner. Um, I'm good provide administrative support uh, to the housing partnership. We have two members online. Yep. Uh, my name is Kayam, and I joined the partnership uh, sort of in March of 2021. I'm Kate Bannigan White, and I joined around the same time. Um, do our guests want to introduce themselves? Yeah, go ahead. Do I go into this? Or? You could just, you no, know, you don't have, you can just, doesn't matter. All right. We can see you through the fancy I, I, thing. I'm Amy Zuckerman, affordable housing advocate, former journalist, investor, paralegal, here to offer anyone legal services for free on filing case MCAD, Massachusetts Against Discrimination Against the Housing Authority for gaming my application. Therefore, Amy Zuckerman, 413 I do have information. I will take your case. I'll help you fight discrimination right now. I have information here, sorry. And I'll join the partnership. Yes. Great, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah. My name is Rachel Roberts. I live in town. I'm a registered architect. I saw you had vacancies on your board and I'm also a um, owner of a multifamily. So I have tenants. I think a lot about affordable housing, housing costs, housing equity. Seems like a possible good fit. So I thought I'd come down. Awesome. Um, thank you both for joining us. Um, so I did want to uh, chat briefly about the Tasty Top project because the next public hearing is coming up on February 7th, I believe. No, February 6th and her 7th. That's going to be that Tuesday, whichever the Tuesday is. All right, so it's February 7th. Um, for those of you who were at the last meeting virtually or in person, they did continue it to February because the developer was not ready, didn't have all of the pieces and answers to all the questions that the board had posed. Following the um, So I just wanted to remind, you know, those of us, I think many of us were planning to speak at the last public hearing, so we should be prepared to speak at the next public hearing. Um, and, you know, I think it will, again, be a really busy hearing. There were about 100 people in the room last time and about 30 people on Zoom. Um, so I think we should expect it'll be similar. Um, so I didn't know if other members wanted to have things they wanted to talk about or mention. 
What date is that? Can you tell me the date of that hearing, please? It's it, it, pretty sure it's February, uh, Tuesday, February 7th. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Where will it be? It'll be online. It'll also be upstairs. Thank you. I'll be trying to be there. Yeah. The agenda is posted. The agenda will be posted on the SCUS website. Right. I will definitely try to be there. Um, I mean, I think what's been interesting is that really the focus has been about traffic and less about the actual affordable housing, um, which is great. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of concern about the traffic and there's obviously there's some open space folks who are not so pleased with the project, so I expect them to have a really big presence. Um, I do plan to speak. Um, Jeff's recommendation um, is that we also try to like not all speak at the same time. So try to keep like all the all the advocates should not go at the same time. We should try to space ourselves out so that they don't hear all the positive stuff in the beginning of the hearing and then all the negative stuff at the end of the rest of the hearing. Um, so, you know, we don't, we can just play that by ear as the evening goes on, but, you know, definitely trying to sort of interrupt the flow of negative comments so that the board continues to hear some positive things. Um, I don't have much else to say about it. I do think it'll take mul multiple more meetings. I don't know how much more play, uh, public hearing they'll have. This could be the end of the public hearing, um, but the meetings could go on for more meetings as they the planning board deliberates but public you meant public comment yeah public comment yeah i typically i mean i don't know what the planning board's doing for this one today i haven't been part of the yeah. sort of planning uh conversations on that but um often they will do public comment for as many meetings as they need and then once the public comment is sort of dried up they um will start their discussions and if any new information is brought up or you know, a new site plan or new things like that, then they'll open up again to public comment. Okay. Um, they typically don't want to have the bulk of every meeting just being people talking for or against it. So um, they may ask people who've already spoken, unless you have substantially new or different information to provide that you don't speak again. They may limit public speak to you know two minutes per person or um, something like that. So I think it's helpful to keep those in mind because like Jenna's saying, if the, all the uh, housing partnership comes up and speaks in the first 10 minutes of the meeting and then it goes on for two more sessions and then you're asked not to speak again unless you have new information. Yeah, like you said, it'd be helpful to yeah. spread that out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has anything they want to talk about regarding this, but I think that's all I really have to mention. It's also been going through the Conservation Commission. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that uh, public have been showing up, the, especially uh, people concerned with the open space losses and tree removals have been showing up at the Conservation Commission hearings as well. So are those hearings on, have those wrapped up or no? No, they're still, they're still open. Um, do either of our guests have questions about the project or have you been following it? I have a quick question. I'm, yeah. actually, I'm not sure if this is appropriate. I understand there's been a lot of issues concerning the housing authority in general. I have issues with what happened to me. So is this the current board for that? I might be wrong to work on there. So this issue? Uh, well, I mean, so we can, we are the affordable and fair housing partnership, um, okay. but we don't have any jurisdiction over the housing authority. I'm so, not, I, I'm not, I work as an advocate. I'm a lobbyist. So I actually love messing with Simone Crawford. She's a you know, state director. So I'm just here to understand. I'm here to help. I got my, I have information on me, and then I go to another meeting. The town clerk told me to come to this meeting tonight. I'm here. I'm here to help. I also plan to agree. So great to meet you. Yeah. 49 years in the media. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to leave soon, but I'm glad to meet you guys. Yeah, okay. I'll just, I'll just okay. respond to that. Um, so I don't know if you've already been in contact with Councillor Brad Riley, um, who has been sort of directly involved in that housing authority um, tenants union stuff. Um, and then I'm also involved with the East Hamden Housing Coalition, um, which hasn't directly been involved in that yet, but we've been apprised of that and are ready to like sort of advocate for that tenants union 
um, if they decide that they want our um, assistance. So I think more so the citizens activism route has been where that's happening in East Hampton. So if you want to follow up with me, um, I would love to talk to you. And we could also, we could probably set up a meeting with Brad Riley and like figure out what it is that we could do both with your experience and with my position on the coalition. And we can figure that out. Perfect. What's your, what's your total number, PM? Um, it's 413-351-5760. Okay, 413-351-5760. And your last yep. name is again? What's your last name again? I can't see it. It's just being recorded. Just I know it's being, I, no, I, that's just, just, but he's, me, I know I, what's happening. I want to ask you because I want to help him. If you mind, I want to help with the this. Please, let me just finish on getting it. What's your last name, please? I'm a media person. Let me just yeah, but you, you're uh, okay. he asked me a question, please. Well, ask okay, me. so so I'll just I'll just say so we can continue the meeting. My my name is public on the affordable and fair housing partnership list. So okay. it's it's a little bit of a long name. I don't want to waste waste all of our time spelling it out for you. No problem. I'll find you. I'm gonna leave soon and we're here to talk about things that help people. Thank you. I'll find yeah. you. Yeah. Can I ask a question about Casey Top? Yes, you can. Um, I've just I've seen the preliminary drawings, but haven't read anything about what is there an, an allocated proportion of units that are affordable. Yes, it sounds like the general consensus in here is that this is a positive. Can you can you like give me like a yeah minute outline of her? So it's a big project. Yeah. Um, is it eighteen buildings? Nine buildings? Yeah. Nine apartment buildings? Each farm building is 18 units. Okay. Um, I think the total is around 200 units. And the first phase is 18, uh, 54 units of affordable housing. And they want to do all the affordable housing first. And they may or may not be doing subsequent phases of affordable housing or market rate housing. But that sort of hits their required percentage of what their future ultimate unit count would be. So, yes, yes, in order for them to have the maximum build out of the 202, they need to have a quarter roughly um, affordable. Okay. And that's overly simplifying it because of zoning, like different zones, different sure. and stuff like that. So. Yeah. so it also has a gymnastics center, a daycare facility, uh, two restaurant pads, and then like some mixed income, like future phases have seemed to have like a little bit more some other commercial buildings also. And they already have tenants, like the gymnastics? No. No. Uh, yes, the, the oh. developer, that seems like really specific. The developer tenants. owns a gymnastics franchise and a deep care franchise. They own Roots in Westfield. Um, okay, so it's a for-profit developer. Yes. And they're, they already sort of have businesses that they're Yes. Right. Here. And then, yeah. And then the last phase is going to be the businesses that they like. There's two restaurant pad sites and the mixed use building, which they don't have any idea about. Really, my understanding that they're you know, they want the wide latitude to be able to get as much flexibility or as much flexibility in who those types of tenants could be. Mm -hmm. So the restaurant pad sites are obviously going to be restaurant buildings, but the commercial mixed use is the offices or and so this developer seems to have their finger in many pots but they have done a development like this before as well they've done housing before they've done some senior housing and i think like some market rate housing they have a consultant to help them on the affordable side which is good um and the city has a housing production plan uh, which we finished we updated in 2021 that lays out sort of our needs in the city for affordable housing and sort of some priorities. And that site is one of the sites that was looked at in the housing production plan as a potential site for housing um, and is zoned to be able to have housing. So, you know, they're, you know, this is a business opportunity for them and the city gets some of the things that we wanted, which is more affordable housing. Units. So the first two phases are basically like the gymnastics and the daycare facility, and then the three affordable housing buildings. Um, rentals. Rentals. Is it all rental? 
all the way down. It will always be rentals. There are not. That's what they're proposing is rentals. Um, I think that has to be when, once they get their uh, approvals from the state, like that will, whatever, if it's rental or ownership or if there's a mixture, like that'll be set. The city's sort of agnostic as far as zoning is concerned, sure. rental versus ownership. I think the partnership and the housing production plan would like to see more affordable rental units, especially at the uh, larger bedroom counts, yeah. which this has quite a few. Um, I think there's a, there's a, there's a really good mix of uh, bedroom sizes. I don't remember the exact breakdown, but um, it wasn't just studios and one bedrooms. There was like twos and threes and maybe even four um, in each of the 18 unit buildings. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay, well, we can move on. We don't have to belabor this, but um, we'll see what happens on the 7th. And um, I think traffic's going to continue to be the big hot button issue. That and, and the open and the open space. And the open space. Um, there's a lot of farmland that this is being proposed to go on, and some of that is also some forested land. Um, yeah. Um, so it's the pitting of pitting of affordable housing against uh, land yeah. protection, which right. is unfortunate. Yes. Yeah. Um, and also, I'll just add, like, if anyone wants to, like, go through their statement that they plan on reading at the uh, public hearing or, like, needs help writing theirs, I am definitely open to to doing that with you. I, I, I do want to say, I'm sorry I don't have my camera on. I'm still feeling ambivalent about the project as a member of the this committee. I'm... You know, I, I'm interested to see what happens, but I, I just have to put that out there publicly that I, I'm not totally sold on this. Um, okay. Okay. Um, well, I am prepared. I mean, I, we can move on to talking about the revised committee description that I circulated with the notes or with the meeting agenda. I apologize. Um, if, did everyone get that when I, I think I emailed it with the agenda? Yeah. Um, so for our guests, one, so we are working on recruitment. That's one of our goals for 2023 because we are down to only four members. Um, we have a nine, we have nine members on the board. So we have five vacancies. Um, I think one of the things that's been hard is um, explaining to the public what the housing partnership does. Um, and affordable housing, it can be really technical and really tricky. And so trying to make it accessible for folks who don't have a background in it. Um, we also have the housing coalition, which Kai can talk about in a few minutes, but that's our, our new initiative. That's more like a grassroots, um, sort of, you know, advocacy coalition. Uh, we received some technical support from, uh, organization in Boston called CHAPA to help us kind of build a broader base of support around affordable housing. And so the coalition can kind of be a more grassroots effort, um, whereas the housing partnership, you know, members are appointed, we have to abide by open meeting law. Um, you know, we have certain things we have to follow. The coalition is not a city committee, so the coalition can meet when they want. They can meet, you know, quickly. They can um, they don't have to have a quorum to make decisions, right? So that gives them a little bit more flexibility. But the housing partnership, we're basically an advisory committee. So we are appointed by the mayor and the city council. We, you know, we apply to be on the committee. And we, you know, our mission has been to promote and preserve affordable housing in the city. Um, and we serve, you know, in an advisory capacity. So sometimes developers um, come to us first before they go to planning or the zoning board because they want to get our support sometimes they come to us if they are seeking community preservation act funds which is uh, funds that we pay a tax surcharge on 
that are mapped in some part by the state to be used for affordable housing, historic preservation, recreation, and open space. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes developers come to us first for that because they want us to support their project and then advocate at the CPA meeting or at city council. Um, and, you know, we get occasionally pulled in to talk about different affordable housing activities happening at the city. The housing production plan um, is sort of our big sort of uh, I forgot about the rental assistance program. Oh yeah, but we that was yes, that's true. So these have to. Well, that wasn't all right. Was that our idea? Yeah, was the CPA's idea? No, well, I mean they. Well, CPA and the housing partnership jointly had a emergency rental assistance program during the height of the pandemic um, that helped folks in the city that had the COVID impact help you know pay for their rent. That was administered by Community Action, uh, which is where I work. So I try to like. Usually yeah. don't think of it because I suffer it. Um, but it was about a hundred and fifty thousand. No, three hundred thousand dollars. I think was approved by the CPA. There's some administrative funds went to that, and it ended up helping about eighty households, households yeah, um, avoiding foreclosure and helping pay their rent during the yeah the, the peak of the pandemic, helping to stabilize them. Um, and then the housing production plan, which is a actually like a state designated document that we have updated every three, four or five years. And that's kind of like our to-do list. So I, you know, if folks are interested in the housing partnership, I encourage you to look at the housing production plan because that's the document that we sort of use as like, what are we going to work on this year? What are the priorities of the city? If something comes up at, uh, before the planning board, the zoning board, is it, does it align with the housing production plan? Um, it's a really useful tool for us as a committee because it gives us sort of like a framework to work within. Um, but as we were talking about recruiting, you know, we did, we've been thinking about like how accessible is our description? Do people read it and understand what we do? Could we make it easier for folks to um, understand what we do and be interested in joining the housing partnership? So, um, I took a stab at redrafting our sort of description and the mission that's on the website. Um, and so that's what's on the agenda. I don't know if ever, anyone has comments about it. Um, we use something at work called, now I can't remember what it's called, um, the Hemingway app, which helps to um, make sure that the language that you're using is in plain language sort of, you know, we strive to write things that are at a grade nine reading level so that it's really accessible for folks and for people who may not have English as their first language. So I did attempt to use that with this description. It still was not easy because so many of the words are kind of technical, but I can continue to work on that because I do think it's important that we make it seem like it's something that's accessible for folks to understand. I'd love to hear it if you want to read it. Oh. I'm happy to judge you. <laughs> but you know, if I think it's understandable. Yeah, I can read it since it's not, um, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> some of this is the same. So the mission of the East Hampton Affordable and Fair Housing Partnership is to, to support fair and long-term quality affordable housing in the city of East Hampton. An advisory committee appointed by city council, the partnership meets monthly. Memberships also often attend other, other city meetings and hearings to support affordable housing. The partnership works with local officials, nonprofit and for-profit developers, and city residents to achieve its affordable housing goals. Some recent activities include updating the 2021 housing production plan, advocacy and support for the school reuse requests for proposals for affordable housing, and applying for technical support to launch the East Hampton Housing Coalition. You could add in the rental assistance. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, but what's missing? Like, what else could it say or include? I'm just going back to our original notes about this. I mean, I think something that might be important to include is our role as sort of like a resource to the community um, for like information on like their housing rights and like just what's going on in the community housing wise. Okay. I think that like, I don't know, as members of this board, we sort of take on the responsibility of like answering questions if people have them and like advocating for them if whatever. 
Um, yes, making referrals. Um, so it, part of our mission has to do with, with fair housing, but we don't, we are not, you know, skilled to like hear fair housing complaints. And we have, you know, organizations in the area that do that. So often if we do get something, something that has to do with fair housing, we often make a referral to the Mass Fair Housing Center, which is really where folks should go if they have fair housing concerns. But we, yes, Kayim's right that we are a resource and can make referrals and recommendations. And if you, if the partnership wanted to expand the fair housing piece of it, there are ways that that would, you know, the, the chair, the partnership and the chair that wants to explore that in the future could like go that route, um, reaching out to some of the fair housing organizations to bring that into East Hampton. I know that there's like a lot of testing and things like that that happen. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts? Do you hate it? Do you like it? Do you, are you ambivalent about it? I liked it. I especially liked how you included like long-term housing. Like you're not just talking about um, like a short-term solution. I think it just helps frame like our mission around a more, I don't know, like long-standing crisis that we're facing rather than just like, I don't know, like affordable housing in general. Okay. I think I stole that sentence from something else we probably wrote or something. I don't think I just thought it on my own. I have a question about, um, I know that new apartments had 10% of their units have to be devoted to affordable housing. Is it new apartments, only 100 units? Can you clarify that for me? Because I know there is a requirement for, for affordable, for like, I think new at least 100 units. Do you know anything about that? I do know, but I don't know this. It just it depends on the zoning. So it's not any new apartment in the city of East Hampton. It depends on the zoning where the build where the apartment is. So for the Tasty Top project under 40 R or the yeah, bylaw. So it's only I mean it's the base zoning. None of the base zoning requires any affordable housing. Right. It's only if you want to increase your unit counts by sort of having a if you if you Multifamily housing with 15% affordable housing allows you to have a smaller square footage requirement or, or like lot size requirement for each unit. Um, under the 40R zoning, that goes up to 25% and the, the, the density bonuses increase. Um, but the base zoning doesn't require anything in East Hampton. And one question is, I thought I'm a realtor too. I thought it was a state law. I don't know exactly if it was a state law, if there were certain, it might be different circumstances, but I thought it was a state law that under certain surveys you had to have so much units, but I may be wrong. So there's a state statute called Chapter 40B mm -hmm. that sets a goal for each community to have 10% of their um, year round housing stock set aside as, as affordable. Mm -hmm. But it's really, it's a goal or a, it's a threshold, but you're not like, we're not required to. They want us to. They want us to uh, make efforts toward that goal, but again, okay. it doesn't, it's... Well, thank you for the clarification, because it's important with my helping people. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I appreciate that. Actually, I am concerned about all sorts of things. I'm here. I can't, I'm like, I don't live here because of the housing authority, but I can help okay. as a resource. Thank you, Holly. I don't live there. Um, I'll tell you what's on there. Okay, so I can add in... Um, the, as the rental assistance example and talk a little bit more about our like our role as a resource to the community. I would say if there's any goals that other than mm -hmm. um, you know, so we, we have in there that um, things that have worked on in the past, but it's not really That's sort of, yeah. what, what are the things that we want to focus on going forward, which may also be up for further discussion or may not, you know, it, and we can get this up yeah, and approve this, and then we can add to it as well. So we don't have to wait till yeah we get all the goals and things we want to work on before we make any changes. Um, that's a great point. Can we put recruiting new members as one of our goals? Sure. <laughs> Go 
goals for 2023 include recruiting new members? Um, that's a great point to be, be specific about the goals. Okay. And we might just be copying and pasting from the housing production plan. Yeah. Um, or linking to pages on the housing production plan. Oh, we, it would be great to link to the housing production plan right from the description. Right, we can do that. Right? Yeah. That would be really helpful. Okay. Yeah, there's once the, once the partnership um, agrees on this, then you and I can, I can upload it and make those changes and then if there's more things you want to see, we can um, links, change it, changes to links or change, because I know some of that it, is just carried over from the old, the old website. Right. And there wasn't a lot of thought was put into updating it, so. Okay. Um, we'd started a conversation about priorities for 2023 back in, I don't know, sometime last fall, and then we sort of got hung up on recruiting. We didn't really get to the rest of actually looking at the housing production plan. So we could do that um, next time in February and really pull out some goals from the housing production plan and talk about them. That seems like a good idea. Mm -hmm. You like the idea that guy is okay? Yes. Yes. All right. Yeah, I mean, I also, I don't know if this is just like a side thought, but the thing that Jamie sent um, from Provincetown, like their like FAQ packet, I think was really interesting and something that I think might be really useful as like, you know, a four or five page document that's really easy to access that, you know, when people are asking on Facebook, what does affordable mean? Like I see this number on the Daily Hampshire Gazette and like, that's not affordable to me. Um, and like having to retype the same Facebook message or a Facebook comment that's like explaining how AMI works and like all that stuff, I think could be better served in something like that document, like a white paper. Um, by the way, Kayim does an excellent job responding to comments on Facebook. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you do, you do a great job. You're always like, I love it. I think it's great. Like when someone's complaining about or there, I think you inserted a chart about population growth in one of your comments. Yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> you do a good job. I, I, I appreciate the praise. <laughs> I, I get too frustrated and then I have to close my phone. I quit Facebook. So yeah, yeah, I think the attempted Facebook page is part of why I quit Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> it can, yes, it's out of control. Um, all right, so why don't we next month um really dive in like look at the housing production plan more carefully and try to pull out some other priorities i mean we have a lot going on so not only is the taste you know the tasty top project but then there will hopefully be some responses to the school reuse rfp um and then that process will start and so that will also you know be coming up um so that will be more advocacy time potentially um so when did that go out? Yeah. That went out in October. And there have been no responses. Well, the deadline is in February. So, yeah, I don't know. Have there been responses? Have there I been? don't know. And even if they were, we wouldn't be allowed to open them or look at them until the response deadline. Okay. Um, I do know that there was a second tour of the buildings with um, sort of Jeff and the interested developers that, so the first tour, there was like a lot of interest. At the second tour, there was um, fewer people showing up, but that was good because those are the ones that are actually committed to, most likely committed to right. um, submitting something, so. Is the RFP on the city website? Yes. Yep. It is, yep. Um, and the, the, complicated, but the like TLDR is the city wants affordable housing in those buildings. Yeah. yeah. And they will entertain other proposals, but affordable, anyone who's proposing affordable housing will get the highest and best scoring. 
Right. Because they're so walkable. That's yeah. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. So that will hopefully, hopefully, there'll be some proposals, and then obviously there'll be there's a. Um, There'll be a committee to review those proposals, but there'll be a public process, so we'll want to be able to, you know, know what's going on there to support it. Um, but so I, you know, we are busy, but I think we should also be, you know, look at the housing production plan more closely. Um, and then I can also uh, work on another redraft of this um, description to give to you guys next time. Um, Anything else on this piece? So we want to hold off on updating the description and install. Yeah, because I'll add in a couple of things that we talked about and then I'll bring it back so we're going to look at it again. Okay. That's fine. Or you can yeah. <laughs> I also want to keep tinkering with the language because I want to try to yeah. Was that like when you sent it out, there was like pink underlining. Was that the. I don't, I don't know if I intentionally yeah, pink underlining. Okay. Because I didn't see it on your email. I only see it on my phone now. So. Can I throw in a little piece of. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Criticism. Um, maybe there's also a mission statement somewhere that this goes with. Is that the case? Or are they meant to be kind of one? This is the This is it. Yeah, and I would say that what's missing there is the mission in terms of like drawing people in from a why we need this standpoint. Okay. Uh, and I think especially if you're looking to recruit a diverse group of people who maybe are not coming from a background in building or development, then they're going to be drawn in by probably personal experience and need. And so connecting on that level will okay. be helpful. That's helpful. One thing to add before I leave, yeah, you might you might want to explain to the city clerk what you're doing because she got I'm glad to find she got me here. I'm glad to find you because I found me, but she didn't explain this correctly. I get grabs. I'm glad to meet you because I'm here to help. You can always tell me. I have 29 years of helping people out there on the streets. Hey, an old lady. Well, thank you for coming. Well, no my way. You can't. People are being discriminated against, and I'm gonna make sure they aren't. They know what to do. They know how to help. I'm here. I, I was, my, I'm, doing that, I'm behind the scenes what my story was. I have my number not to that on the run now. I'm very tired, but thank you very much. Okay. I'm losing my phone too. <laughs> I some Chinese food down there. I love it, you um, All right, so I'll work on a redraft and send it all out to you before our next meeting. This is what it did. It's on your faces. I'm dying of him with the pink line that's underneath it. Oh, yeah, you I'll know why? Him. Exactly. Because yeah. so when I pick, cut and paste it into the Hemingway app, it will underline things that like in pink that are complicated. Yep. And so it must have like kept the formatting when I, but I didn't see it on my end. Like right. That. And when I looked at it on my, like on my computer, it came out like you printed it just to, but it didn't have any of the. It's from that must have been because I copied. I was tinkering in it in the app, and then I pasted it into the email. Uh, Yes, it underlines if it's right. pink, right. if it's gray, then it's fine. If it's yellow, it's like sort of complicated. And if it's pink, it's like too complicated. Anyway, it was judging you. Yeah, it was, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was hard to do. But it's a great app. If anyone at ever like hasn't used it, it's really helpful. We've been using it on uh, we have at work, we're doing a website redesign, and so we're using it to make sure that all the language on the website is like appropriately appropriate grade level and readable. So um all right. Last last thing on the agenda is just housing coalition updates. So Kayam, I didn't know if you had some updates you wanted to share about the housing coalition. Um yeah, I mean there's not a lot of new stuff that's happened uh thus far. Um our next meeting is on January 31st at six. Um so if anyone's interested um, any of our guests here are interested, <laughs> um, but I mean, we're mainly just eyeing the Sierra Vista project and like figuring out how, you know, what things we want to, what concerns we want to bring, um, and what 
statements of support and whatever we want to bring. Um, I know that I personally, like, I definitely want to bring up the name because <laughs> I think that that's something that people have a problem with, or I've heard a lot of people have a problem with. And I think it could win a lot of goodwill in the community to just like kind of drill down on that and be like, all right, let's change the name to something that everyone will like. And then maybe there'll be a little bit less public vitriol around it. Um, but I don't know, other than that, we're just looking in the near future at some sort of documentary slash video content that helps to like humanize um, the need for affordable housing in the city. Um, it seems like a lot of people like mentioning my uh, responding to Facebook comments, a lot of people don't really understand like how dire the need is and like what affordable housing looks like and what residents of affordable housing look like and like what the actual numbers are in terms of how much you need to make to like qualify and how that's actually a lot more people than people think. Um, so all those things. Um, and yeah, just like trying to figure out how our actions in um, sort of in tandem with this committee can be used to meet like both of our goals. And like, cause I know that our mission statement is a lot more geared towards destigmatizing and like public education um, and like rallying around specific issues, so. Great. Um, that sounds great. Um, yeah, I had already sent my comments to the planning board before last time, so, but I was, they're five, what I, they're five minutes long, so I was like picking and choosing like what I was going to say because I don't want to, that's too long, so. Um, I don't have anything else. I don't know if anything else, anyone else has anything else? Jamie, is there anything else? Yeah, I wanted have? to, um, I just was looking at the Gazette, um, the other day, and they had, um, article about this, in here doing the, um, real estate transfer, um, that Brad Riley was working on, um, before he became a city councilor. Yeah. Um, and so it looks like Amherst is now applying to the state for special legislation to uh, to enact a 2% real estate transfer tax on properties over 200% of the average or something like that. So um, throwing that out there as like to be put in a fund to support it more housing amongst other things. Um, they they also wanted to increase their tax revenue, or their. They, I think they're they're using it for three things: affordable housing, municipal reserves, and I, I, I don't know. But it's like the first hundred and twenty-five. Oh yeah, town affordable housing, town operations, and the capital stabilization fund. Right. Um, well, that sounds really fascinating. Like, is there anything? that we're being asked as a committee to like contribute to that process this is for amherst this is not for east hampton oh oh sorry i must have yeah. misheard. i was i was just pointing that out there as like a you know if i know i know brad brad council riley was um interested in that at the state level uh trying to get that passed in the last Right, it hasn't passed on the state level, right? So Amherst is asking for a special, does it like to do it in Amherst? Is that what this? Essentially that they are. Yeah, let's get to it before the legislature. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, and which the lot, legislature passed it, it would then be an option for towns to employ it or it would just, Yeah. It, it, so, I mean, so like the history of the Community Preservation Act started out in a similar way with a lot of towns on Martha's Vineyard applying for special legislation to do a special tax um, that then they could use those funds and it passed and then I think the Cape Cod towns wanted to do it and then the states first. well let's do this rather than like doing 350 pieces of special legislation let's and they came up with the Community Preservation Act um, but the Martha's been, been Martha been, Martha's been your land bank mm -hmm. uh, was sort of a model that became the CPA so by Amherst doing this they 
like the, the land bank act is different than cpa and they don't have to do cpa in order to use the land bank stuff similarly like amherst might be getting things in their special legislation that don't actually right. make it into the final bill right um interesting so just putting out there is like something to either keep an eye on yeah. or um putting out for consideration that that's something that the partnership or the coalition wants to advocate for in East Hampton, um, you know, that put it out there as things to consider. Um, we could also find out what's happening on the state level on the real estate transfer fee. Um, I could look that up for next meeting. I haven't, I get a lot of emails about stuff like that and haven't been very paying very close attention to it, but we could also see what's happening on the state level. Like, where is it? Is it going to, is it going to pass, right? Because if it's going to pass on the state level at some point, then that saves us a lot of time. But yeah, it's interesting. Because that Amherst is so out of the time. Right. And, and on that note, um, something that I've been watching since like the last legislative session is um, the state working on repealing the section of um like the preemption on rent control and stabilization um i think that that's something that was referred to a committee at the end of the last session and it's something that could be really um interesting to look into both like because i know that it, some cities have done a similar thing where they've applied for special legislation to allow that to happen um but i know that like it's been on the state legislature radar and like i've you know, I've pinged some of the state representatives about it, but they haven't really been super, like not really since this, uh, since the legislative session started. So it'll be interesting to see what that turns into in the like next couple of years. So are you hearing that they're looking to allow communities to do rent control or basically just removing the preemption because there's a lot on the books right now that basically just bans it outright um so allowing the communities to vote on that specifically would be really good in my opinion <laughs> there are some definitely housing advocates that advocate for that would be in um support of that i feel like it's i don't know i mean i i just feel like there's so many big landlords that they would, they would be very unhappy about this, that their lobbying efforts would be extreme. But I think you're right, if it's just removing the preemption and then it still has to go through a process at the local level, then um, that's interesting. Okay. Things, to, things to watch. Um, anything else we should know? Um, Any town lodging updates? No. Nothing. Okay. Um, so last we had updated the um, Valley CDC was like looking into their more design. Mm -hmm. um, they got the report back from the historic um, that it did not look like it was used for a burial ground, which was good. Um, so yeah. we uh there's a property at 75 oliver street um commonly known as the town lodging house that is owned by the city yep. it was a, the longest operating poor farm in the state until 1993. until 1993. <laughs> And then the city for a long time was leasing it to a nonprofit called Smock. And they were basically providing single room occupancy housing for low income residents um, and operating the building. But the building was owned by the city, but it needs a lot of repair. And so last spring, I think, Smock basically kind of pulled out and moved all their folks into, they, they operate a few other buildings in the city, uh, moved everybody out to other units. Um, because it needs a lot of repair, but it has a historic preservation on it and a deed restriction on it. For historic historic preservation, affordable housing, and then the land around it's all in 
open space protection, agricultural preservation restrictions. So it's very limited. It's complicated. Um, it was it was 23 units of SR single room occupancy. So basically a lodging house. Um, and it's not that popular for people to like, you know, not be able to cook or shower or bathe or use the toilet. Not, so they're not like fully functioning housekeeping units. They're they are like, not independent housekeeping units. Yeah. They all there was common common uh, bathrooms on each floor and one communal kitchen. When it was the, when it was the <laughs> like what happened? When it was the um, poor farm, there was like a house manager and they would cook communal meals and things like that. Everyone was required to pitch in or pay rent or whatever. Um, but since it's that model is no longer in existence, we sort of transitioned to a single room occupancy. But Valley CDC is looking at it from how can we um, make it actually a place where people want to live. Um, and so they're looking at sort of the enhanced SRO type model, which would have like kitchenettes and in-unit bathrooms. Um, and that would lessen the number of units in the building and building an addition. And then the concern was if they build an addition, did while it was operating in its 150 year history, did anybody, did they have like a part of a plot where they were using it as a burial ground? And that that was not recorded or known because if yes, we definitely can't build on that site <laughs> or in that location. Um, and there are other, other historic features on the site that because of the historic preservation restriction, mass historic will say basically, we don't want you building a new building, new looking building. So if you can disguise it to look like a barn, you know, or one of the outbuildings or make it look like something that had been there, you know, a historical building, then the thought is that maybe mass historic would approve that. Um, it's been a priority of the partnership because it was serving really low income residents. And a lot of folks were coming out of shelter. They're paying three hundred dollars a month was the rent for yeah. the and with like hot plates and things like I mean it was just, a communal kitchen. So yeah. Okay, so there was still access to that. There was space. still a kitchen. It's yeah. just it was shared. Right. Um, and, and they weren't doing communal meals, but they had a large industrial fridge with. And there was a there was a one of the tenants was designated as like the. I guess the um, the door parent, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like that the house manager, right, right. Um, and it's also not in a. It's you know it's a little bit outside of town, so it's not in a you know from the state's perspective, it's not in like a great location because it's you know. But we've been you know interested in trying to preserve it just because it did meet this need where folks could come out of shelter or out of, um, you know, a, a, a sober house or something like that. And like, this would be a good next step before then they moved on to something else, but it's complicated. And so we'll see what happens, but I don't know. Right, so there's no kidding. No kidding. Okay. Um, and it's Valley CPC is the one that's taking the lead on research there. Yeah, so prior to this, Valley CDC applied to the CPA and got funding to do pre-development assessment work for affordable housing. And they were looking at four or five locations that the city had identified in the housing production plan to like flush those out, see if like they could actually make a project happen at any of those locations. Um, one of them was where the Sierra Vista Commons was, but um, they were not getting any interest in the then owner because the owner eventually sold it for like 1.2 or 2.2 million dollars uh, to the current owner. And Valley CC looking at it from affordable housing was like, "Will you give it to us? Yeah, you're <laughs> not going to pay 2.2 million dollars. We're, we're not going to pay above market rate for it." You know, 
Um, and so they were looking at a bunch of different properties and as part of that, this sort of smock left as that project was starting. And so they started to look at this re redevelopment of this project as well. Um, but I still think they're, they're still looking for another site uh, in East Hampton to do a larger affordable housing development. Um, all right, I don't think I have anything else for tonight. So I will work on the continuing to rewrite the mission and the description. And, you know, I encourage folks to even just attend the public hearing on the seventh, just to listen to see what's happening. And obviously, you know, speak if you'd like to, but there's no expectation. Um, and I think that's it. It is 7.09. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'll second that motion. <laughs> oh, can someone make the motion? Oh, okay. I'll make the motion. Sorry. Right. I second it. I second it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will have the meeting notes for next time. I apologize for not having it this time. I just didn't get to it. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. This government meeting is brought to you by Eastworks and our local cable subscribers.